five, four. 50 years ago, a Saturn V rocket, the most powerful, the most massive the world had ever seen, lifted off from Florida's Kennedy Space Center. Apollo 11 was on its way to the moon. The men who would make history sat inside a tiny spacecraft atop the Saturn V. Four days later, as Command Module Pilot Michael Collins circled the moon, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on it. Well, when it got down to 30 seconds, we're still about 10 feet above the ground. Ah, we got it made now. Down and a half, 30 seconds. Really the most important part of that mission was landing and when we landed and i said uh, contact light engine stop and a few other things and then i patted neil on the shoulder it appeared to us uh, when you're doing the p-52 maneuvering charlie duke who himself would later walk on the moon was in houston's mission control and so we knew they were on the ground, uh, hopefully right side up. Then, quiet. A pause until Armstrong's now historic words. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. I was so excited when I, my response came out first, Roger Twang, and I knew that wasn't right. So I corrected it in the middle, mid word. Twank, I mean, tranquility, we copy you on the ground. Roger, twank, tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Between July of 1969 and December of 1972, 12 men left their boot prints on the lunar surface. Then it was over, finished. The last three scheduled missions canceled. Al Warden was Apollo 15 command module pilot. My personal opinion, I think we had six successful landings and we're worried something could happen. And we could have a hundred successful landings and one where we lost a crew and that would be the only thing that people would remember. During the heady days of Apollo, there was a sense the Earth would no longer keep humans bound to it. As a species, we were moving outward, and it would not stop at the moon. Where did you guys think we would be by now? Oh, John, I got to tell you, I think back in the day, before they canceled 18, 19, and 20, we were really on a roll. And I think we all thought we'd be on Mars by now. I really did. It's, it's a big leap, but my God, man, going to the moon was a big leap, too. We did that successfully. There's no reason we couldn't have built the program to go to Mars. As men were flying in space, a young Costa Rican boy was flying his imaginary spacecraft. We built, uh, we would have just a, a spaceship, which was just a, a cardboard box with, with chairs, you know, that would laying on their backs and we would, you know, lay down on, on our chairs and, and launch. We'd go through a countdown, a, a real countdown, and, and then they would go, you know, go and explore and um, return home in time for dinner. <laughs> so it was an amazing... Real quick trip. It was an amazing time. Franklin Chang Diaz was captivated by space travel. As the Earth tugs on the moon, so too was Franklin caught in the grip of space exploration. At the age of 17, with $50 in his pocket and not speaking a word of English, Franklin went to live with relatives in Connecticut. You ended up going to school there, going to college there, getting, right? Yeah, I ended up, uh, I ended up in, in the city of Hartford. Uh, there was a, a family of uh, cousins of ours who, out of the goodness of their heart, uh, they put me up, they, they, they opened their home to me. By the time he was in college, the Apollo program was ending. He was given advice that, to this day, Franklin is glad he didn't take. I was going to go to work for NASA. That's what I wanted to do. 
And uh, when I told my aerospace engineering professor uh, that I was going to do that, he said, don't even think about going into the space program or going to work for NASA because you're never going to get a job. Because look around you. There are um, you know, thousands of aerospace engineers out of work because the Apollo program had been uh, canceled. Franklin went on to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, earning a doctorate in plasma physics. Then he fulfilled his boyhood dream. Five. All three engines up and burning. Two, one, zero, and lift off. During his 25 years at the U.S. Space Agency, Chang Diaz flew on the space shuttle seven times. No astronaut has ever flown more. But Franklin never believed the rockets he flew on and his Apollo predecessors went to the moon on would get humans very far. There had to be something more advanced. It, it, was, it was incomprehensible that we would go beyond, much beyond uh, the moon with those kinds of um, um, propulsion systems. Does it surprise you that we haven't gotten farther than we already are? Haven't been back to the moon in 50 years. Yeah. Haven't even sniffed Mars at this point with yeah. humans. Yeah. Um, or given what you're saying about chemical rocket limitations, maybe it doesn't surprise you. Well, it doesn't surprise me that we haven't gotten there. Uh, because we really don't have the means to do it. We, 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 we could pour you know, billions of dollars to, to, to an Apollo-like you know, mission to Mars, and we would just maybe go and make a successful landing, come back with a few rocks, plant the flag, and come back, and then it'll be another 50 years before we do that again. So clearly, the, the, the lesson of Apollo was that it was, it was a, I mean, it was a remarkable achievement, but it was not a sustainable one. There are many who agree with Chang Diaz. One of those is fellow space shuttle veteran, Scott Parazinski. The technology really? is not that hard. Um, I, I personally believe that chemical rockets are not the way to go. I, I prefer uh, design, and I don't want to get too uh, technical for your audience, but maybe they're interested. But, uh, you know, plasma ion engines, I think that's the way to go. And uh, so the technology is, by and large, ready to go. It's just we're, we're lacking the resolve. This is the lab. And the now, lab. if you haven't guessed, the man working on developing these revolutionary plasma engines is Franklin Chang Diaz. After leaving NASA, he founded the Ad Astra Rocket Company near Houston, Texas. <laughs> In the vacuum chamber in his lab, his team has repeatedly tested small prototypes of Franklin's rocket. It works by converting argon gas to super hot plasma that eventually shoots out a stream of ions and electrons that produce thrust, ultimately going much faster than current rockets can move you. The highest speed will be around 55 uh, to 60 kilometers per second. So it's like going from, like from here to downtown Houston in, in one second. Or to Mars in 40 days instead of six months. There is, Franklin says, a fly in the ointment. You need a lightweight nuclear reactor to produce electricity to make his plasma engines work for a Mars trip. That technology does not exist. But for now, the technology of plasma propulsion is here. It's available. It's technology that we know how to do. And we have wasted 50 years. You know, 50 years is a long time. And uh, we haven't started yet. And it's time that we um, embark on a, on, a, on a massive development of uh, nuclear electric power for space and for space, uh, space propulsion. Five years ago, when I first sat with Franklin, he was confident. You do believe that your rocket will power, you know, astronauts to Mars someday in your lifetime? Yes, yes. Now there are cracks in that belief. You still believe that? Well, you know, I'm getting old. 
Uh, <laughs> we all are. I'm getting old, and uh, I never close doors, and I never give up on things. Uh, maybe that'll happen. So there's still promise. There's still hope. Hope. You never lose the hope. <laughs> hope is the last thing that goes. Franklin hopes to test a larger scale plasma engine on the moon. He may get his wish. In what seems a fairly sudden course correction, the moon, not Mars, will be the next stop. Call it deja vu if you'd like. Humans are going back to the moon and then on to Mars. Well, I think we, we, we gradually have come to our senses in that you know, when we say, let's go to Mars, or we're going to Mars, uh, that is nice. It's nice that we want to go, but we really can't do it. We want to go to Mars because there's uh, a lot of, lot of evidence of uh, you know, free-flowing water, water ice and such, so the conditions for life may have once existed, may still exist, so we, we fundamentally do need to go to Mars. But there's some amazing uh, science yet to be done on the moon. We only visited um, with uh, astronauts uh, six landing missions. We've had a, obviously a number of uh, you know, landing uh, flights with robotic craft, but lots more good work to do on the moon than I think we set sail for, for Mars. The renewed interest in the moon and to a larger extent just flying in space has become infectious. India is planning to put three people in orbit in 2022. Russia wants to build a new rocket to send cosmonauts to the moon by 2028. The Japanese space agency is teaming up with Toyota to build a moon rover. The United Arab Emirates is sending a small probe to Mars next year. China is moving steadily to land humans on the moon by the end of the decade. The U.S. space agency, NASA, plans to land astronauts, including the first woman, on the moon by 2024. I am encouraged by the uh, the League of Nations that are now really pursuing spaceflight. You know, your, uh, United Arab Emirates has their own astronaut. Uh, India, Japan, uh, potentially uh, independent access to space. Obviously, China's uh, you know done a, a number of you know incredible uh, yeah. firsts, uh, including landing on the far side of, of the moon. So uh, th there's a an incredible energy around the the space industry now. This is Boulder, Colorado. It may surprise you, but one of the most fascinating and successful robotic space missions is run by planetary scientists right here. You can do your own Pluto flyby. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Alan Stern is a planetary scientist and the lead investigator for the New Horizons Pluto flyby mission which sent back stunning images and data, revolutionizing our understanding of the dwarf planet. I, I like to say the solar system saved the best for last. Stern has been part of 29 spaceflight mission teams. He's led about half of them. We are living on the cusp, Stern believes, of a spaceflight revolution. I think the moon is always gonna be our bridgehead and that what we'll see as the 21st century goes on is uh, humans to Mars, humans to asteroids, and then humans all across the solar system, and not just by NASA, but by the space agencies of other countries uh, and by private corporations. That's what, the, it sounds like science fiction, but it's not. The 21st century is really going to be the breakout moment for the human species into the cosmos. It is far from science fiction. Those private companies like Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, and SpaceX are on the verge of making space tourism a reality. Within the next year, both Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic Fire. Fire. hope to begin flying passengers on short flights to the edge of space. And SpaceX is building what it calls the Starship to take people on trips around the moon. We're space explorers. We are space explorers. Iranian-American Anusha Ansari is not fond of the label space tourist. She is a pioneer, the first privately funded female space explorer. Ansari flew on a Russian rocket to the International Space Station in 2006. She spent nine days there. The experience, she says, is humbling. It was uh, really, uh, you know, a shift inside you when you're in space and you look at our planet and um, 
not only look at our planet, but you look at it with a background that is very dark and you see these amazing stars in the distance, but you like, this is it. This is all we have. This is our home. Ansari's trip cost millions of dollars. When the private companies begin flying, the cost for a ticket to ride won't be near as much, but still no bargain. At least $200,000 a seat. The question is how quickly it becomes, um, you know, cheaper for more people to experience it. And that's a matter of time like anything else. I believe the prices can come down rapidly over the next couple of decades. The really big development that's it's sneaking up on us is the development of commercial spaceflight uh, and uh, making what was once rare, humans to space, into something routine and lowering the cost dramatically through reusable rockets, for example, and reusable spacecraft. Uh, I think it won't be very long before private corporations are putting people out in the solar system for a whole variety of purposes. Perhaps the most profound of these purposes to better our world and preserve the human species. What's the number one reason you, for you that we should be? I, I think uh, human curiosity is the, the main reason we should be going. Uh, we, we, anytime we, uh, uh, we challenge ourselves to, in a new hostile environment or a, a new goal like this, our, our society benefits with, with new science, new technologies, um, new capabilities that improve the quality of life here on Earth. Every single biologically alive thing on Earth has a mechanism to ensure the survival of the species. That's a great imperative to humans, is survival of the species. I believe the space program is all about that. I think eventually Earth will be, um, I call it humanity's national park. Uh, the Earth will be a, um, uh, a patrimony of humanity, a, a, a beautiful place, a national park, a, um, a legacy of, of, of humans, not a uh, worn out shoe, all polluted and unfit for life. Um, it will be a beautiful place. And most of humanity will not live there. Most of humanity will be elsewhere. They will be born elsewhere. And, um, but we will always be able to come back to um, our home planet and see where our roots are, where we all came from. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Neil Armstrong's one small step 50 years ago, in large part, set the stage for where we are today and where space travel will take us tomorrow.